What's going on guys? The Comics Kid 2099 here. Today I want to talk to you about X-Men, The Trial of Gambit. Uh, this is a pretty big book, something like 15 issues here to talk about. And uh, this is written by Scott Lobdell, uh, Ben Rabb, and Steve Siegel, with art by Joe Moderia, Melvin Ruby, Brian Hitch, Chris Boccolo, Andy Smith, and Carlos Pacheco. And uh, this book, unfortunately, is a little bit of a hot mess. And I think that uh, there's a lot of blame to go around. I think partly we can blame the people who were making these comics at the time, and also, I think we can blame whoever was in charge of collecting all of these issues into a trade paperback and uh, how they decided to do that and the order that they decided to present these issues. Uh, also, I think a big problem was calling this book The Trial of Gambit. Uh, there's less than one-fifth of this entire book that actually has anything to do with uh, Gambit and uh, him being put on an air quotes trial. Uh, the rest of the book uh, has to do with a group of X-Men going into outer space to save the Shi'ar Empire. Uh, we have a subplot of an X-Men group trying to cure the legacy virus, and then we have a couple flashback issues that take place before X-Men issue 1, and then we have uh, the X-Men in the Savage Land before that finally uh, leads into uh, the Trial of Gambit. So very little of this book actually has anything to do with the Trial of Gambit. I think if they had called this Road to Operation Zero Tolerance, I think it would have been a little easier to get through this. Uh, also, we have so many subplots here that I already talked about a little bit, and almost none of them actually intersect or have anything to do with each other. So that's that also made it a little difficult for me to want to keep reading because we would have some uh, cliffhanger ending of an issue and then we would go like five issues before that cliffhanger would be resolved and that makes it very difficult for me to want to uh, keep going when I have no idea when or if you're going to resolve a cliffhanger from closer to the beginning of the book. Uh, there are some subplots here that don't even get resolved in this book at all. Uh, because this takes place immediately before Operation Zero Tolerance, there's stuff here that gets handled in the Operation Zero Tolerance omnibus that does not get resolved here. For example, uh, Jubilee was kidnapped in the Generation X comic, and that's brought up a little bit here. Professor Xavier is in the clutches of Bastion, who is the guy who is in charge of Operation Zero Tolerance, and then uh, there's a group of X-Men uh, who are in China, I believe, and then they encounter one of Bastion's spaceships, and then uh, that gets followed up in the Operation Zero Tolerance storyline. So uh, there is stuff here that has a lot more to do with Operation Zero Tolerance than it does the Trial Gambit. So I feel like if they had just titled this book something else other than The Trial of Gambit, I would not have gone into this expecting most of this book to have something to do with Gambit being put on trial for something that he did in his past. Unfortunately, though, there's like two or three issues that have something to do with that, and the rest of it has nothing to do with that. Uh, so we start off with a group of X-Men uh, being kidnapped by Gladiator of the Shi'ar Imperial Guard because the Shi'ar Empire is in danger from the Phalanx. Uh, we saw the Phalanx before in the Phalanx Covenant storyline. In that book, uh, they felt like a credible threat. Here, this group of X-Men spends less than two issues dispatching the Phalanx group, and they do not feel like a menace at all. Uh, they're stuck in space for four issues, uh, plus the one issue that it takes for Gladiator to kidnap them against their will and send them into outer space. So there's five issues of this story, and two of those issues, the X-Men are fighting the Phalanx, and they do not feel like a credible threat at all. I don't know how else to describe that. Uh, when we saw them in the Phalanx uh, Covenant storyline, uh, they seemed like uh, they were a huge threat uh, here. It doesn't seem like uh, it takes the X-Men hardly any time or energy at all to deal with them. It seems like uh, they could have just had the Shi'ar Imperial Guards stick around and deal with these guys, but for some reason, uh, Lilandra forbade them uh, from coming and dealing with the Phalanx, uh, so she sent them to Earth to do something, uh, and they had their own Shi'ar Imperial Guard uh, miniseries that they were in uh, set on Earth around this time, uh, but then when the X-Men come, uh, she even says, okay, whenever I forbade Gladiator from coming to deal with this threat, I was really hoping that he would send the X-Men to deal with it, and I'm thinking, why? It didn't take them any time at all to deal with the Phalanx. Why did you want the X-Men here? Uh, Gladiator by himself could have dealt with all these guys. Uh, so that was a little weird. Uh, we also have a subplot where Bishop and Deathbird are uh, kind of becoming uh, friends with each other. And I kind of like this idea, but not at the expense of Deathbird being handled uh, very inconsistently with how she used to be written in the 1980s. In the 1980s, she teamed up with the Brood. Uh, she was incredibly bloodthirsty. She was willing to kill in order to take over the Shi'ar Empire. Here, we're told that uh, she just wants what's best for the Empire, and she's really just a misunderstood anti-hero. She was exiled uh, from her home whenever she was young. Uh, we're really just told uh, that she's not all that bad. Uh, I don't like any of that. I don't mind the idea of her being friends with Bishop, because he had never met her before this book, so he wouldn't have a bias against her like some of the other X-Men 
Anne would, but I don't want them to be handling her completely inconsistently from how she was written in the 1980s. Uh, so that was really bad. And then at the end of this group of issues, the X-Men are about to go through a Stargate, uh, not like the Stargate TV show, although kind of, I guess, uh, it's a big portal in the sky, uh, a wormhole kind of that they can control. They're about to go through to Stargate, and then this gigantic ship that's like 800 times bigger than the ship they're in, it basically crashes into the X-Men ship and into the Stargate. Uh, we never find out who is in this ship or why they crashed into the Stargate and the X-Men ship. We never find out at all, uh, so I don't even know if that uh, subplot was ever uh, resolved, but then uh, we don't get to see what happens to this group of X-Men for like over five issues in this book. Uh, so we jump into a three-issue storyline where a group of X-Men, they go to China to try and cure the Legacy Virus storyline, and I really could have done without this group of issues because A, I don't really like the Legacy virus. That was uh, one of my least favorite subplots of the 1990s. It went on way too long. It was introduced in like 1992, I think, at the end of the Executioner's Song storyline. And then it was resolved in like 2000 or 2001 uh, when Colossus uh, took the cure that uh, killed him. Uh, so yeah, it went on way too long. And anytime you have a group of issues that are devoted to the legacy virus, it's basically, hey, we're useless. We can't solve this problem. It's going to keep killing mutants and humans alike. Oh well. And that's basically what we have here. Uh, we have a really weird team up with Shang-Chi. Uh, he comes to his friend's house. His friend has summoned uh, the X-Men and Shang-Chi to his house because he knows Logan from back in the day. And so Shang-Chi comes. Uh, he deals with a bunch of ninja. And then out of nowhere, Wolverine attacks Shang-Chi, even though he knows that Shang-Chi is not an enemy. And then Storm starts electrocuting Wolverine, telling him to stop attacking this guy. Uh, this book definitely does not understand uh, the relationship between Wolverine and Storm. I feel like there's much more respect between these two than what this book has. Uh, so anyway, after after Shang-Chi then knows that uh, he and the X-Men were both summoned by his friend uh, to that house, uh, the X-Men continue to spy on Shang-Chi for some reason, and then that's basically just there to show us that Shang-Chi is awesome, and he can tell whenever a group of telepaths are spying on him, and then the X-Men basically say, well, we had to make sure that you were on the level, and I'm thinking, you are guests in this home. Shang-Chi is a guest in this home. You don't need to make sure anything. Uh, the guy who invited you guys, he should just be telling all of you, hey, X-Men, Shang-Chi, you guys are going to be working together. Uh, Wilson Fitz, the Kingpin, is here, and then uh, Sebastian Shaw of the Hellfire Club, he wants the X-Men to help him, uh, and then it's all just a really pointless storyline where the X-Men are not able to cure the legacy virus. So let's move on uh, to uh, two issues here uh, that are part of Marvel's minus one thing that they did in like 1996 or 1997. Uh, I actually really like the minus one issues quite a bit. I just don't think that they should have been collected in this book, especially not at this point in this book, where we've already gone three issues without having any idea what happened to that group of X-Men Space, and now we're going to go another two issues, still without resolving that cliffhanger ending. Uh, these two issues are all right. Uh, there's one of them where Professor Xavier and Magneto, uh, they are at Auschwitz, I believe. Uh, it's the camp that uh, Magneto was at when he was younger. Uh, sometimes it's explicitly said that it was Auschwitz. Sometimes uh, it's just a generic uh, concentration camp. But they're there basically talking about how they're going their separate ways, and that's a fine issue. And then there's another one uh, where we have uh, Rachel Gray and uh, Mother Sanctity, uh, both from the clan Ascani, and uh, that's a long, drawn-out thing. I'm not even going to try and explain what that's all about. Basically, uh, they come back in time because Mother uh, Sanctity, she believes that uh, she can alter the time stream so that her father and brother, uh, Bolivar and Larry Trask, are not going to uh, try and create the Sentinels and basically uh, ruin humanity. And then Rachel says, no, we can't alter the past. I've tried it before. Uh, it's bad. It doesn't work. And so those issues are fine. I really enjoyed the minus one issues uh, that came out around this time, all the ones that I read. Uh, I think it'd be kind of cool if Marvel just collected all of the minus one issues in one book uh, instead of putting them in the middle of a book like this where we're already uh, have a whole bunch of subplots going on and then uh, you're going to stall us for five issues at least uh, while we're waiting to see what happened to those X-Men in that giant explosion in outer space. Uh, so anyway, after the two minus one issues, guess what? We have another issue that's going to stall us for uh, a little while uh, so that we have no idea what happened to those X-Men in outer space. Uh, this one, we have Spider-Man teaming up with Mero, uh sort of, uh, to fight some Sentinels from the Operation Zero Tolerance thing, and that's a fine issue. We get to see that J. Jonah Jameson, although he hates Spider-Man, he is actually a fair reporter, at least in this issue. I'm sure that this is very inconsistent with some portrayals of Jonah. Uh, sometimes he's portrayed as being a fair man who's just really grumpy, and then sometimes he is uh, portrayed as being uh, very uh, inconsistent and uh, basically just yellow journalist. Uh, but anyway, uh, in this issue, uh, he's talking about how much of a threat to humanity Operation Zero Tolerance is, and Bastion even comes and says, hey, I can give you this really juicy news bit that you can use if 
you'll just kind of back off and leave me alone. And Jonah says, uh, screw you. I'm not going to do that. You killed a really good reporter. And uh, I really like that issue. I thought it was kind of fun. Uh, but again, I don't think that it should have been collected in the middle of this book. Uh, honestly, it probably didn't even have to be collected at all here uh, since it has absolutely nothing to do with the trial of Gambit. Uh, so anyway, uh, that group of X-Men that was in outer space, uh, they land in the Sha uh, the Savage Land. And uh, I was about to say Shadowland. That's an entirely different thing. And uh, Bishop is not with them. Uh, Deathbird somehow was able to take Bishop and separate herself and him from the rest of the X-Men. So they're still in outer space and Bishop is in traction. Uh, I don't even know what's going to happen there or how he's going to get back to Earth. Uh, but anyway, uh, the X-Men, they land in the Savage Land somehow. And then there's this group of mutants who are trying to kidnap uh, Gambit because they worked with him before. And they're working for uh, Eric the Red. And every time Eric the Red shows up, he is not who he seems. Uh, one time uh, in the late 1960s, uh, Eric the Red showed up and it was Cyclops with amnesia. It was a really dumb thing. And then uh, one time it was a Shi'ar agent. And this time, spoilers, it's the real Magneto. Uh, because uh, in this group of X-Men that were in outer space, we had Joseph, uh, who everyone was saying was Magneto with amnesia. Uh, turns out the real Magneto is here and he is the one who is putting Gambit on trial. Uh, this is a really dumb reveal uh, because Gambit, uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, not Gambit, uh, Magneto, he tells uh, his uh, robot henchmen uh, that the reason that he did this was to try and split the X-Men. Uh, if they don't trust each other, it's going to be easier for him to defeat them later, except that he doesn't split the X-Men. He just splits Gambit off from the X-Men. Uh, Rogue leaves him in the Savage Land, and they all go back home without Gambit. Uh, so he didn't split the X-Men. He just split one off from them. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's why Magneto, in disguise, is trying to reveal Gambit's crimes to the rest of the X-Men. And the crimes, actually, I feel like it is worth the wait once you finally get to the last three issues of this book where we finally get to see what the trial of Gambit is and what it's all about, uh, we find out that he actually gathered the Marauders for Mr. Sinister and then uh, they went on a job uh, to the Morlock Tunnels to exterminate the Morlocks. And Gambit had no idea that they were being gathered to do an extermination job. Uh, he claims that he would not have gathered them if he had known. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, he did save one Morlock from the tunnels. It was uh, Marrow, who we saw earlier in this book, and somehow Gambit was able to get Marrow to uh, Mikhail Rasputin, who lived in an alternate reality where time moved much faster, uh, so he gets her there when she's like five years old, and then she comes back when she's in her early 20s. Uh, I have no idea how Gambit was able to get Marrow to Mikhail Rasputin, how he even knows Mikhail Rasputin, uh, but that's not even uh, mentioned here, uh, but we do find out it was Marrow that Gambit saved here. Uh, but anyway, uh, basically all the X-Men are really mad at Gambit for his part in the Morlock Massacre, and so they leave him in the Savage Land, and then they all go home. The end. Uh, so, like I said, this book should not have been called The Trial of Gambit since so very little of it actually has anything to do with The Trial of Gambit. Uh, but then again, if you call it The Road to Operation Zero Tolerance, a whole lot of it doesn't have to do with that either. Uh, you would have the three-part storyline where the X-Men are trying and failing to cure the legacy virus, and then you would have the two flashback issues, and then you would have the five issues where the X-Men are in outer space, and none of that has anything to do with Operation Zero Tolerance. So, uh, no matter how you slice it, this book is just a big huge bundle of subplots that have nothing to do with each other, and I feel like if they had just uh, kind of uh, focused a little bit better and kind of rearranged some of these subplots a little bit and done some of them in a different order uh, or uh, handled them a little bit better, I think that this book would have been much easier for me to have digested, uh, but as is, this book was just really difficult to read. Uh, it's not even that the subplots themselves are necessarily bad, although some of it is kind of stupid. Uh, it's just the way that all this is given to you is very poorly done. Uh, so anyway, I don't think that I can recommend uh, X-Men The Trial of Gambit unless you are a huge X-Men fan like I am and you want to have all the X-Men books that you can, in which case you probably already have the book. Uh, but anyway, uh, those are my thoughts on X-Men The Trial of Gambit. I hope that you guys liked this video, and if you did, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I will be back later in the week with another video. In the meantime, you guys have a great rest of your day. Catch you later.